Um, so what I want to talk about today is involving students in real case work, in, in real field work. And it's important on a number of different levels. I teach forensic science courses, and I know from being a former crime scene investigator, students absolutely, positively will not get a job in the forensic sciences if they don't have an internship or if they don't have some sort of real world practical experience. And it's also been my um, experience that there are more students studying the forensic sciences than there are internship opportunities. So, you know, we have a, a slew of students that are waiting for a position with whether it be Baltimore County Police Department, Baltimore City Police Department, Anne Arundel County Crime Lab, um, and they'll wait and they'll graduate before their number even comes up on, on the queue list. And so I'll get emails two, three years after students have graduated, what can I do to get my foot in the door, to get some sort of experience? Um, so what I want to talk about today is an opportunity that arose a number of years ago, about four years ago, for me to take students into the field to work a real forensic case, get real world experience, and how that has blossomed into something much larger than I could have ever imagined or ever anticipated. So uh, since this case that I'll talk about in, in just a few minutes, this being the, the um, case that got the, the ball rolling, we've been out on probably six cases and have had about four come into our lab, our forensic lab at Towson. Um, so without further ado, let me just talk about this case a little bit. The, the victim in this case was a young man named Mike Hogan. Um, William Michael Hogan, but you call him Mike. And um, Mike's father, the victim's father, is kind enough to join us right here and, and hear this presentation. Um, <clears throat> so this all started about four years ago when I received a phone call on my cell phone from a man who's now my friend. Um, and he was telling me how his son had been missing for four years and the body, part of the body had recently been recovered, but the whole investigation was essentially a CSI nightmare. And was there anything that we could do to help? We, me, students, anyone, could we, could we do anything? And so just to give you a little bit of background on the case, um, Mike, suffered from OCD, and he was 26 when he went missing, 25, 26 years old, when he went missing. He had severe OCD to the point he couldn't function in regular society. He, he just would get hung up on tying his shoes or looking in the snow to see if he had hit someone with his car. He couldn't function, and he had to be in a therapeutic community. And so the Hogans, Mike, and, and his ex-wife Sandy, they found a place called Spring Lake Ranch in Vermont, um, a very fancy facility, clearly a high dollar facility, where Michael would go and he would live there. He would receive treatment, um, but he would also learn some skills. He would learn how to top trees and make syrup. He would learn carpentry skills. It was a therapeutic environment. Um, and so Mike had been there for a year or so, maybe a little bit longer, and um, and by all accounts enjoyed his time there. <coughs> he had made friends, he was doing well, he had plans to come home to attend a, a graduation, um, and one day he went missing. He was supposed to answer the telephones after lunch, and, um, and he never showed up. He had been seen in the morning working on the woods crew and he never showed up. Interestingly, preceding this was a fallout with another member of the, of the ranch that I won't go into, but probably factors heavily into the story. Anyway, Michael went missing, and he was missing for four years. Um, now, you can see, just by looking at the images here, it's a heavily wooded area. It's Vermont. You know, their tapping trees were set. But the people that work at this ranch, they go out into the woods every single day to, to harvest the, the, the sap. They also log the areas, actively hunted. So for him to go missing for four years, despite numerous searches, despite the Hogan's paying money to have legs drained and having um, private canine search and rescue teams go out, Michael was never found. Four years later, hunters stumble across his skull less than a half a mile from the ranch, um, right off of a path that was actively traversed by ranch tenants every single day. 
Um, Michael was found in, in a wooded area, basically where I'm standing, and the path is where the doors are. So how people could not smell him, how people could not stumble across the body, still, to this day, remains a mystery. Um, so when the hunters found the skull, the police were dispatched, Vermont State Police, they went out, and, um, and I'm not saying anything that they wouldn't tell, tell you to your face, they didn't really process the scene like a crime scene. Um, they went out and moved around some leaves, picked up the bones that they saw, and called it the day. They never called crime lab out, they never did a concerted search of the area for personal effects or for evidence. Um, so the Hogan's received notification that Michael had been recovered. They go to, to Vermont right after the body had been shipped to Maryland to meet with the detectives, and they learn more about the story. They learn that it, there was no forensic anthropologist that was called in to look at the remains. Um, Mike's wife Sandy had opened the casket to say her goodbyes to Michael and was horrified when she saw that there was hardly anything in that casket. So there were tons of remains that were still out there. Um, Mr. Hogan had asked for Michael's personal effects. The detective reached into a desk drawer and threw him across the desk, not even in a bag. Nothing had been processed for fingerprints or for evidence. Um, they handled, handed Mr. Hogan Michael's shoes and bones from his feet fell out in his lap. Michael had already been buried at this point. Absolutely horrific, horrific circumstances. These are some of the remains that were found. Um, these are major elements, bones of the, the leg, but you can see that they look like sticks. They found the big ones, but there's 206 bones in the human body. They didn't find any of the any of the small ones. So when Mr. Hogan, that's what they found. Um, so when Mr. Hogan contacted me, he said, is there anything that we can do? Absolutely anything. And so his concerns, and, and, I'll, and I'll read them quickly, his concerns were Michael had a falling out with another ranch member, and it was never investigated. Um, the body location was not processed as a crime scene. The, con the contents of his wallet, which you just saw on the previous slide, were processed for fingerprints. There was no chain of custody on anything that was recovered. Um, the family was told that all of Michael had been recovered, and you can see from that previous image there was hardly anything. Um, his shoes still contained evidence, the bones of his feet. Um, the location of recovery wasn't systematically searched for evidence. His clothing was missing, his lighter, his keys, all his personal effects were still missing. Um, the area had been logged and had been hunted, and Michael wasn't found. Um, so, and there was no forensic anthropological examination of the remains. There was one image that was taken at the morgue, um, and it was taken by a student that was interested, and I quote, was interested in forensics. So the medical examiner called her in to quote unquote get her feet wet. Um, you know, that's not what a family of a deceased individual wants to hear that, you know, students are getting their feet wet on their son. Um, and one of the things that we do in forensic anthropology, one of the very first things that we do is we lay out a skeleton in what we call standard anatomical position, which is like this. It doesn't include your feet and your hips. The radius and ulna are up by the shoulder and they're on the wrong side. The ribs are upside down and on the wrong side. The vertebrae, so are we, are we to trust that this student who got her feet wet was able to successfully live with the remains and say that there was no evidence of trauma? So when I met with with Mike Senior, I said, I can't, I can't redo the police investigation. And it's a, it's a very slippery slope. You know, if, if we go up there, we're going up there because they screwed up, essentially. Um, and we were concerned that if we did go to Vermont, the police wouldn't even take us to the right location for fear that they would have egg on their face, because I knew we would find remains. Um, when I met with Mike and Sandy, they said, how confident are you that you'll find something? And I said, 95%. And I later found out that you guys thought I was full of it, but, um, <laughs> but we found a lot. So I said, what we need to do is we need to get permission from Vermont State Police and their invitation to come up and just do a once over of the scene. You know, you gotta keep your enemies close. Um, and so that's exactly what we did. And we put a plan in place and we developed what we call a forensic science student organization, which was a means to funnel money and, um, and provide logistics and provide us with the, um, the legal coverage that we needed to take a group of students out of state. But what I did was I, I found a bus. Um, Dylan's bus service holds 38 people, so I said, 
38 people want to come to Vermont, the first 38, I don't care what your major is, as long as you're willing to go outside and work, let's do this. And so we did that. Um, we scheduled our trip for May, um, right after right after the semester ended. As a matter of fact, several students missed graduation to participate in this endeavor. We had graduate students, undergraduate students, um, mostly anthropology and criminal justice majors. There were forensic chem majors. There was even an English major that we somehow heard about it and came. Um, and the plan was, if we found remains, we would, by law, have to turn them over to the Vermont State Medical Examiner's Office. But ultimately, those remains would make their way back into my custody, and we would take them to the Smithsonian Institution and have them formally evaluated by my colleague, Doug Owsley. He and I did, would do the skeletal examination. In the meantime, we would file an order of exhumation and have what was previously buried with Michael uh, exhumed. <clears throat> and so, just to give you some shots from the field, before we embarked on this endeavor, students underwent um, rigorous training. We talked about the use of compasses. We talked about laying in transects. My husband's an archaeologist. He teaches here. He flew up the week before that we were out there and laid in survey grids, five meter grids that we would work in. Um, students were trained in their mapping and excavation, recovery skills. Uh, one of the forensic chemistry students that accompanied us was a crime scene investigator with Prince George's County Police Department. MPG County let her unload her crime scene van and bottom of the bus. So we took all of our evidence and, um, and digging tools and gloves and bags and ties, everything of that nature was provided to us. Um, we were not shy about asking for assistance. We went to Lowe's. They provided us a free of charge with buckets and tarps and gloves. Um, grocery stores provided us with water and Bug spray. So it was amazing how many people and how many um, businesses in the community came together and provided us with lots of tools um, that we would need. But so students had rigorous training in, in the field. How, how are we going to operate in the field? How do you work within a transect? How do you do these controlled surface collections? So we trained for about three days doing that. Students also were trained in the identification of human and animal bone. I didn't care if, it, if they found human bone, I didn't care if they found animal bone, I just wanted them to find bone. And then I could come up behind them and determine if it was a human or animal. Um, this turned out to be a very important exercise in the sense that there are coyotes in Vermont. I didn't know that. And the coyotes were getting all the, the, the fawn. So there's animal bone all over the place. But um, sure enough, students were, <clears throat> were finding bone left and right. We also had a training seminar. Um, we knew what had been recovered with Michael, meaning we knew what had not been recovered. So we had a training seminar where I had real human skeletons and students were able to familiarize themselves with the elements that, that we were looking for, elements that were missing. We also knew what Michael was wearing at the time he was missing, so they had their eyes out for, um, for clothing and personal effects. This is a bird's eye view of the, the map that we made. This is the trail. Keep in mind, this is all heavily wooded. This is where the, the hunters found the skull. So you can see it's way off of the trail. And then these are the five meter transects. So students were assigned, three students were assigned to each transect, and they literally, from the trail's edge, got on their hands and knees and just started searching. And within the first five minutes of the scene, we found our first bone. Um, this is just to give you an idea of how thickly wooded this area was. This is also important in terms of the timing of the search, which was May. We wanted to go out before that ground cover really started to take hold and, and would obscure anything that was on the, on the ground. Um, and Mike and Sandy were out there with us. This is one of the detectives. <coughs> Again, we were very suspicious of him at the beginning. We didn't know if he was going take us to the right location, but, um, but he certainly did. Um, this woman here is kind of funny. I just have to point her out for a second. I, her pants probably should have given me the first clue. Um, she was just some random woman that showed up. And I thought she was associated with the police department. And she was convinced that Michael was trampled by a um, But it turned out not to be the case. We later found out that she's on 
the psych side of the ranch and got out and somehow joined our search team. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you can see this, but this is found within the first couple minutes of being on the scene. You remember when we found this. Um, the detectives had walked me back with, with the Hogan's and um, and said, this is where he was found. You're not going to find anything. Look how thick and spongy it is. And I said, but there's this rib right there. Um, so that was the very first bone that we found. And, and this was exciting, too, for the students, because at this point, they knew. They absolutely knew that we were going to find stuff. So it, it was invigorating to them. Um, some of the animal bone that I talked about for Bambi, um, lots of animal bone out there. But like I said, it wasn't important if it was human or animal. As long as the students could find it, I would later tease out what it was and, um, and determine if it was human or fauna. Yeah. One of the areas, and I credit this entirely to the students, let me go back to the map for a second. If you, if you look right here, this boundary here, this is a, a wetland area, it's a marshy area, um, and at its greatest depth, the water would be up to one's knees. Um, the detectives didn't want to search in the marsh because it's wet and it's nasty and they get their suits messed up. But the students could care less. They were out there to work. And boy, did they work. Uh, <laughs> this woman, the woman that was convinced that I was killed by this, but thought that perhaps the coyotes had dragged, and I hate to be graphic, but it is what it is, um, parts of Michael into the marsh. They said, she said that. They tend to feed in areas like that because they're protected. They can concentrate on their food source and not on other scavengers. So she was convinced that we should look in the, in the marsh. And so students were first to jump in there. And again, very thick ground cover. I'm looking for a particular slide. Like I said, this isn't the PowerPoint that I intended. This is Tiffany, the crime scene investigator from Prince George's County, and she's working with students I'm happy. Well, I have this slide up. Let me just go off on a little bit of a, a tangent here. I'm going to come back to this at the end. Things that we do in the classroom, such as mapping and photography and crime scene documentation, you know, things that are exciting the first night, but you know, six weeks into the semester, students are complaining about they don't want to map anymore, they don't want to take measurements. On a real case, it takes on so much more meaning. Students were up until the wee hours of the night trying to figure out how to calibrate their compasses, how to work within these transects. It, it, it's no longer a multiple choice question. It's something that they're doing because it matters. They're doing it, and it's going to go into a homicide case file. So things like this take on tremendous new meaning. So um, the student here, Amanda, who, who's mapping, she hemmed and hauled for months when I would make her map. And look at her, she just looks like, you know, best thing since sliced bread. So this is the slide that I was looking for. Um, these two, two students, Savan, who's now a PG County crime scene investigator, and Maria, who works in a forensic toxicology lab. Um, <clears throat> they're in the swamp, and you can't really see, it's cut off, but Savan is up to her knees in mud, and she's trying to move. She's trying to show Maria what she's just found. Um, the problem is she's moving, but her boots are not moving. She, in the subsequent slide, she falls down on her back, completely underwater in the swamp. But she holds on to what she had found in her hand. And so we get her up and look at it, and it's a tooth. She found Michael's tooth in that swamp water, just reaching around blindly. And so Mr. Hogan was out there, and I walked up to him, and I said, did Michael have a, a cat on his tooth? And he fell on his knees and said, yeah, when he was riding his bike for the first time, he was training, was taken off, he fell on and broke his tooth. And so we knew at this point, not only do we have remains, we've got personal effects. And I believe this is in his missing persons poster, isn't it, that his tooth was kept? I think I saw, it doesn't matter, I, I think I saw it in there. Um, so some of the remains that students were finding are pretty obvious, you know, it's a humerus, it's a bone of the upper arm, but other ones are not that obvious. And again, we were out there for three days, 
and students were literally on their hands and knees the entire three days or in the swamp. And in addition, we found Michael's clothing, found his lighter, we found his keys. All of this, his water bottle, more clothing, we found his hair. Um, this is one of the transacts, what it looked like before we started, and one of the transacts when we were finished. <clears throat> so, so this is the way an investigation should be done. Um, just some images of packaging up evidence. So then phase two, and, and students were involved in every step of this investigation. The, the remains that we recovered and the personal effects were taken to Vermont State Police. The remains were taken to the Vermont State Medical Examiner's Office. And just as planned, when the medical examiner released the remains, he drove them right here to Towson and, um, and we, we curated them in the, in the forensic science lab. In the meantime, Mike and Sandy filed an order of exhumation to have what was previously buried of Michael. Exhumed. And, um, and that took a couple months. We got out of the field in May, and the order was signed in August. And so Mike and Sandy and me and students, we went to Del Air Memorial Gardens, and, um, and Michael was disinterred, taken to a funeral home, and the remains were subsequently transported to the Smithsonian, just like we had in our plan. And so this is where things get interesting. I think it's interesting the whole way around. But um, so we get the remains to the to the lab. One of the things that I could see in that one image that was taken in the morgue was this little crack right here. And I thought possibly it was a nasal fracture. <clears throat> As it turned out, it's just a, a suture. We all have a suture that runs down our nasal bone, but for the majority of us, ours is midline. Um, Michael's was off a little bit, which made his nose just a little bit crooked. Um, so that turned out not to be anything. But what we did find that was significant um, were fractures to his vertebrae. And again, students were involved in this investigation too, more, more as an observer at this point than an active participant. Um, but before I get to what we found with Michael, one of the things that we had to carefully and thoroughly document <coughs> was post-mortem damage to the skeleton. In other words, when we present what we found that was wrong with him, we need to be able to justify that this is paranormal trauma, this happened at or about the time of death, at or about the time of death, and distinguish it and tease it away from post-mortem trauma. So what are some of the post-mortem things that we see? On this bottom image on the left, <coughs> you can see all of those puncture marks. Those are from IO teeth. We also have gnawing, root gnawing. Um, and we also have degradation of elements that were in the swamp. The pH of the swamp water completely ate up some of, the, some of these bones. Um, I might have a slide of it. No, I don't. Um, in another presentation, I actually have the both humeri, both radii, both ulnae, which are bones of the arm side by side, one of which was in the swamp, one wasn't. And even the diameter of the bones is, you know, it's like night and day. Um, so we have lots of post mortem trauma, um, primarily through the swamp water and through animal predation, but of significance to us, what we found was that Michael had several fractured vertebrae. And this is something that was not found at the Smithsonian. It wasn't found by the student, student um, observer. <laughs> and, and we also know even, we, we, have, we have the blue vertebrae. We don't have the ones with the brown arrow. However, based upon the location of the fractures, on this one and this one, we know that this one would have been fractured too. So at the end of the day, we have several bones that have been broken. And just to give you some examples, this is a perimortem fracture of the centra or the body of one of the vertebrae. And this one, you're looking at it from the side and the top is flayed down, that's perimortem. When you think of bone fracturing, um, 
green bone or wet bone breaks like a stick. You gotta fray it, you gotta twist it and bend it. Dry bone is like a dry stick on the forest floor. You just break it and it snaps. For that fraying action to happen, for that piece of bone to still be adhering, we know that that bone was wet when it was fractured, or it was a periform injury. These are facets that should extend out to here. These are the locking mechanisms of your vertebrae. Michaels are sheared off, and about four vertebrae completely sheared off. Another periform fracture, another periform fracture. This is a compression fracture where a vertebrae has collapsed upon itself. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, I think we raised more questions than perhaps we answered. Um, the case is still being investigated by the Vermont State Police. They've, they're taking another look at it. Um, what we hope as students, though, is that, or what my students have hoped in my goal, is that um, the Vermont State Police will rethink how they handle and how they investigate cases of missing persons. Um, Michael was not considered to be a vulnerable adult despite the fact that he was seeking psychiatric treatment um, for severe OCD, as I've already mentioned. Had he been treated as a missing and vulnerable, vulnerable adult <coughs> by Vermont State Police's own admission, the scene would have been processed entirely different and the missing person's case would be, would be handled entirely different. So back to the students, what did they get out of this? Well, it was a humbling, absolutely emotional and humbling experience for all of them. In the classroom, we talk about you know, working with the media, what to say to the media, what not to say to the media. We talk about mapping, we talk about interacting with victims' families, which is a huge component. Um, and it just does not do it justice to talk about this in a sterile environment in the classroom. I've had students who participated in this case and have since contacted me and emailed me and said it was one of the most moving experiences they have absolutely ever had. Several of them have also um, pinpointed this as being a career starter. Um, when they've gone in for interviews, they've been able to say, yeah, it was on a real case, and we found a real body, and yes, I, I've worked you know, in the morgue, and I've been on exhumations. Um, as I said at the beginning, this also has jump-started what seems to be a trend in, in our department right now, um, in the sense that we've gone out in several cases in Tennessee, Last summer, I took 38 students, 38 seems to be the magical number because that's the threshold, um, to Tennessee to work on the Holly Bobo case and a Rachel Comber missing person case. Baltimore County Police Department has called us out in two cases, um, both missing persons cases. One, um, students found a, a, a decomposed body, essentially, in Overly, and, and uh, on another case, we did a search for human remains. A skull had been found on the property of a high school. Students went out and they found the rest of the body. Um, last night, I got a call from Baltimore County Homicide and I have to meet them right after this because the skull was just recently found in someone's basement. Um, so I'm going with some students to investigate that. Um, but also in terms of diverse student learners, I, you know, you always have the students that sign up for these things and you're thinking, uh-oh, like, geez, do you really want to take them out of state with me? And I'll tell you, some of the students that I have been the most concerned about in the classroom have absolutely excelled in the field. You know, you, you just put the information in a different context, in a different venue, and, and they excel. Um, when I went to Tennessee, I had one student who was our media um, contact, so anytime the media had questions, she was the one that was put up front to answer, answer the questions. Um, in Tennessee also, we work very closely with one of the victim's families, and I have another student who was a psychology student, and she was the point of contact for them. So you know, to go back to what we were talking about this morning with the keynote speaker, these diverse opportunities, these opportunities to learn the same information in a different context, that's what this is, is all about. In terms of applying it to your classrooms, this is a little different in the sense that we are called upon when there's an exigent circumstance. But when I was listening to this oil spill, or, or chemical spill, I'm sorry, in West Virginia, 
I thought, you know, in a different venue, it would be absolutely a perfect opportunity, if that were to be in Maryland, to have a group of, say, geology students or geography students that were trained in hazmat, motivate, get them up, get them out the door, have, have them put their skills to work. So I'm not saying that, you know, in all of your classes you can go look for dead bodies, but, um, but, to have, but to have a group of students that's trained in a skill, biology, you know, wing washers, when there's an oil spill, have students go down to Florida and, and take care of waterways. Um, there's ways to, to train students and keep them motivated um, and, and give back to the community that this is part of so, Thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. Coleman? I'll shout, was there a credible conjecture about Michael's death based on the new evidence? I'm sure there were many conjectures. The students were probably very much involved. In yeah. Um, well, we know he died from his blunt force trauma to the spine. The, the, the trauma to the spine itself probably did not kill him. It wasn't high enough in the cervical spine, but it would have rendered him incapable of walking. Um, the person of interest um, Brian, uh, it has a long record. Um, he's a big guy. What we what we think it could be is possibly some sort of martial arts movement, um, but we just don't know. One of the things that was suggested was that maybe he climbed a tree and fell out, but the injury is is over the too much of the spine for that to be the case. And if you Think back to that very first rib that we found that was encased in that spongy stuff. That forest floor is like a mattress. You could jump off of a tree and bounce back onto the top of the tree. That would not have done it. Um, there was also some conjecture that maybe a log had broken off. They called it these wheel makers. It was the first time I had ever heard of that. But you know, these big sticks fall off and it could have hit it. But it's the same argument. It's, it's spread over too much of the spine and it's a force. It's a shearing force. It's not the the spinous processes that are fractured, it's the actual locking mechanisms. Like, it, it, I hate to turn myself around, but it's an action like that. Um, so again, I think we opened as many, you know, raised as many questions as we provided the answers.